come to verse 4 in the root text. And the theme of this verse is the elimination of mana, which is translated conceit. So let us read it together first in the Pali. Yo manam uda buddhi ase sang. Yo manam uda buddhi ase sang. Nala setum va. Nala setum va. Sudu balang. Mahoko. Sudu balam Mahoko. So biku jahati ora parang. So biku jahati ora parang. Ura go jinamiva. Ura go jinamiva. Tachang puranam. Tachang puranam. And so the translation has one who has entirely swept up conceit as a great flood sweeps up a fragile bridge of reeds. That monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old worn out skin. Okay, so here, conceit is being compared to a fragile bridge of reeds. So, usually conceit can seem like a very strong, rigid, tough state of mind. But here, apparently, when insight, wisdom is developed into the true nature of the body and the mind, the basis for conceit, then that conceit weakens to the point where it becomes just like a bridge, a sort of tentative bridge of reeds that might be been constructed by the villages and put across a stream in order for to cross the stream conveniently. And when this great flood comes by, it just sweeps away that bridge of reeds. Okay, now we can look at some of the additional texts that I collected dealing with conceit. And first, the word conceit itself. Okay, the word in Pali is mana. Which comes from a verbal root, ma, which means to measure. In fact, there's a somewhat distant relationship between this root ma, meaning to measure, and the particular standard that's used for measurement in virtually all the rest of the world, <laughs> except for the United States and maybe a few other holdout countries. And that word is meter, <laughs> which means both the measurement of length, one meter, and also in poetry, the measure of the rhythm, the, the framework of rhythm. Okay, so we have mana derived from this verb meaning to measure, because mana results from our measuring ourselves against others. At least that's the way it manifests. 
And so the texts, usually when we hear the word conceit, we think of somebody who considers themselves to be superior to others. But the Buddha, or the Buddha's texts, distinguish, distinguish three modes of conceit, three types of conceit. And so these are sometimes called, or I translate as, the three discriminations. So the text says there are these three discriminations. What are the three? The discrimination, I am superior. Or the dis then comes the discrimination, or the thought, I am the same. I'm just as good as you. And then comes the also the discrimination, a little surprising to be a tech type of conceit, but it's the discrimination or the thought, I am inferior. Oh, I'm not as good as they are. Everybody is so much better than me. I'm such a failure. I'm a real loser. <laughs> we would say, friend, you have to regain your self-esteem. <laughs> you have so much going for you. No. <laughs> that, from the Buddha standpoint, is a kind of conceit. It's called the inferiority conceit. And so, the text says there are these three discriminations, or three kinds of, call it, deluded thought. And this Noble Eightfold Path is to be developed for direct knowledge of these three discriminations, for the full understanding of them, and then for their utter destruction and abandoning. And this is from, it's an Abhidharma text called the Vibhanga, which then gives a, a, a more detailed elaboration on the threefold conceit. Okay, and it also explains some of the items that serve as the basis for the arising of this conceit. So what is the conceit, I am superior, I am better than the others? Okay, someone on account of birth. And birth here, it doesn't mean that you think, I was born and other people were <laughs> not born. But birth is, the Pali word is jati. And so India in the Buddha's time was divided into four broad social classes which one's membership in these classes was determined by birth to so the four groups were the kshatriya, the brahmins, the brahmana, the vaishya, which was the merchant class, the merchants, the traders, the businessmen, also the agricultura, agriculturists who owned parcels of land. And then the Shudra, which were the workers, the laborers, And the sense of, you might call it entitlement, based on one's birth, the sense of privilege, was very, very prominent in the Buddha's time. And even, I mean, it even continues in India down to the present day. Okay, so the Kshatriyas, actually that's an interesting, maybe an ex exemplification of conceit in the texts composed by the Brahmins, the Brahmins are in the number one place 
followed by the Kshatriyas, then the Vaishyas, and then the Sudras. But the Buddha's text, the Buddha came from the Kshatriya class, and so the Buddha's text put the Kshatriyas first, followed by the Brahmins, then the Vaishyas, then the Sudras. And then in this class system, there were those who were considered outside the class system. So these were regarded as even untouchable. And so those are the ones that are considered the outcasts. And those would live separately and they would do what was the kind of work that was considered the lowest type of work, which would be working in the cremation grounds, collecting the, the garbage and the trash. So it was a very, very harsh, even sometimes a brutal type of class system, which the Buddha himself say, rejected in principle though the system was so deeply entrenched in Indian society that the Buddha in his monastic order dispensed with class distinctions. In fact, he said that just as the waters from the four great ocean, the four great rivers, when they flow into the ocean, they lose their separate river identity and they become just water of the ocean. So the members of the different classes, when they go forth into the Dharma and discipline of the Tathagata, of the Buddha, they lose their name and class identity and they become known as just followers of the Buddha. And there's one really beautiful story that comes in the, the Theragata. These are the poems of the elder monks there was a, an outcast by the name of Sunita, whose job was to go around and collect the cast out flowers. You know, when people in their homes, they make offerings of flowers to the gods, then when the flowers wither, they just throw them outside the house. And then it's the job, one of the jobs of the outcast is to go through the street collecting the flowers. So this man, Sunita, was going from house to house, collecting the cast-off flowers. That was his, cast, his out duty as an outcast. And lo and behold, who comes walking down that same street? The Buddha followed by his retinue of monks. And so Sunita sees the Buddha and he's agitated and frightened. This is the powerful ascetic Gautama has gone forth from the royal Kshatriya, Shakya Kshatriya class, and here I'm just a wretched outcast collecting these flowers, and the Buddha is getting closer and closer, and so he's very anxious and agitated, sort of leaning up against the wall. And then the Buddha turns to him, the Buddha can see sort of deep into the minds and the mental dispositions of people, and he sees Sunita. He says, good day, Sunita. And the Buddha says, uh, Sunita says, homage to you, Bhagava. And the Buddha says to Sunita, would you like to be ordained as a monk? And Sunita had never considered anything like that before. But he says, yes, Bhante. And so then Sunita becomes ordained, he becomes a monk. And then there's a scene where Sunita is at night, probably a full moon night, he's out meditating, perhaps on a rock, and the Buddha is in the distance looking at him, and while Sunita is meditating, his mind becomes liberated from the asavas, from the defilements, and he becomes an arahat, sitting there meditating. And while he's sitting there meditating now with his mind completely liberated, Saka, the king of the gods of the sense sphere, descends in front of Sunita, the former outcast, 
and pays homage to him and then returns to his Deva world. And then Mahabrahma, this is the chief deity of one of the higher divine realms, he descends to earth and bows down to Sunita and pays homage to him. Because even though Sunita is a human being, but becoming an Arahat, he's worthy of the homage even of the gods. And then the Buddha recites a verse that it is by effort, by diligence, by purity of conduct that one is a Brahmin, not one is not a Brahmin by birth. Okay, that was a rather long explanation of conceit on account of birth or clan, different clans, different families, physical beauty, wealth, people from wealth who have a lot of wealth think they're superior, people with high education, profession, artistic skill. How did profession get there twice? Copying. You see, I told you, everything I do goes wrong. <laughs> artistic skill or learning or eloquence. or on some other ground, many other grounds, gives rise to conceit, thinking, I am superior, I am better. So such conceit, elation, self-aggrandizement, that is called the superiority conceit. Okay, then comes the conceit, I am the same. Okay, so basically the grounds are the same. And then on this basis, Somebody gives rise to the conceit, I am the same, I am just as good as they are. Of course, you know, if we have certain talents and abilities and skills, we should recognize them and not try to denigrate ourselves because of those skills. And also, if we're not as good as others in certain respects, we recognize this objectively. That's just the nature of things. But one doesn't bolster oneself up or put oneself down on this basis. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Okay, then we come to the third type of conceit. This is the inferiority conceit. So someone on account of birth, clan, family, and so on, all the ways through to eloquence or any other ground, gives way to self-abasement. Worth, worthless, good for nothing, so such self-abasement, self-devaluation, self-undevaluation, self-contempt, self-belittlement, so that is called the inferiority conceit. Okay, the reason why all of these forms of conceit are considered something undesirable in Buddhism according to the Buddha, is because all of these conceits devolve around the idea, I am. I am this, or I am that. And according to the Buddha, the very notion, I am, is the fundamental delusion. It's what sort of emerges from that ground of primordial avijja, ignorance the sense of I am, and then when that conceit I am arises, then one, on that basis, one starts looking out, comparing oneself. How am I doing? How am I rating? That's the big thing nowadays, ratings. Mm -hmm. you know, even you order a book from Amazon, how many stars do you give the book? <laughs> I just got it three days ago, and they're asking me, how many stars do I give the book? <laughs> and now I hear even <laughs> college teachers, you know, we used to gra <laughs> grade our students. <laughs> 
Now they're grading us. <laughs> At the Duanyan summer camp, do the campers grade the teachers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of grades do I get? <laughs> <laughs> you sure? <laughs> Five stars or just four? <laughs> uh, well, they're not stars, oh. they're number, but it is one to five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not going to put you in an embarrassing position. Okay, so here the Buddha sort of lays it out. So he says, he's speaking to somebody named, a disciple named Sona. So he says, when any ascetics and Brahmins, or actually it really could be when anybody, on the basis of physical form, the body, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness, regard themselves thus, I am superior, I am the same, or I am inferior, what is that due to, apart from not seeing things as they really are? And when you see these things, these five constituents or five aggregates as they really are, then one sees them as impermanent, as, because they're arising and passing, as dukkha, as being unsatisfactory, and as being subject to constant change. So when the five aggregates have such a nature, then there's no basis for holding to them or conceiving them as even as taking them to be a real, solid, persistent, substantial I or self. And so when there's no such substantial I, then how can one think, I am superior, I am the same, or I am inferior. Then here's a sutta. And what has to be said is that amongst the defilements, there is the subtle conceit, the conceit I am, which persists in people even through the first three stages of realization according in the Buddhist scheme of liberation. The stage of stream enterer, the one who achieves stream entry, the first breakthrough to realization, eliminates the view of self. So the stream enterer will no longer accept the idea that I have a real substantial self. So they'll no longer accept that at the intellectual level, but at a deeper level, that subtle clinging to I or I am remains in the stream enterer, the once returner, that's the second stage of enlightenment, and the non returner, the one on the third stage of enlightenment. So in disciples at those stages, the thought, I am, will arise, and even they might, with subtle thoughts, compare themselves, I am superior, I am equal, I am inferior. But when those thoughts arise, that because they've seen through the delusion of self, they recognize these are deluded thoughts, and they won't entertain those thoughts, they won't persist in holding to them. Those thoughts just arise because there's still a layer of primordial ignorance that remains not yet eliminated. But with the breakthrough to the fourth stage, the stage of arahatship, then that residual layer of ignorance is swept away. And when ignorance goes, then the conceit goes along with it. Because we could say that the conceit, I am, is the, maybe the manifestation or outcropping of the primordial ignorance.
an outcrop of the primordial ignorance. And so here in this sutta, a monk, otherwise not known, named Kema, comes to the Buddha and says, Bhante, when a monk is an arahat, one who has finished the task and so on, completely liberated through final knowledge, it does not occur to him, there is someone better than me, someone the same as me, someone inferior to me. And then after saying that, the Buddha agrees with him, then the monk Kema departs. And then after he leaves, another monk named Sumana comes to the Buddha and expresses basically the same idea, but in the converse way. He says, when the monk is an arahat, one liberated through final knowledge, it does not occur to him, there is no one better than me, or there is no one the same as me, or there is no one inferior to me. And so after saying that, the Buddha agrees, and then Sumana leaves. Okay, so always when the Buddha refers to a particular obstacle or hindrance of the mind, he'll always give the antidote to that, the medicine to eliminate it. And so the particular medicine for eliminating conceit is given in this sutta. Okay, here a monk named Radha comes to the Buddha and asks, Bhante, how should one know, how should one see so that in regard to this body together with consciousness and regard to all external objects, all external signs, eye-making, mind-making, and the subtle tendency to conceit no longer occur within. Okay, here we have first two paired terms, eye-making, In Pali, it's ahankara. And my making is mamankara. So these words are based on the ordinary word for I is aham. And we can use that word conventionally as a convenient term of expression because otherwise it would sound rather stilted if I say something like, this set of five aggregates would like a cup of water. <laughs> so it's useful to, and convenient to say, I would like a cup of water. Or this set of five aggregates will be going outside for a walk. <laughs> Yeah, so I say, I'll, I'll go for a walk. So we use this word as a convenient means of expression. And so that is harmless, but the harm comes in when we turn that I, take it to be a point of reference, an inward point of reference. So I am this, I am that. So that is what is meant by I-making identifying the I with anything amongst the five aggregates. I am the body, I am feelings, I am perception, I am volition, volitional activities, I am consciousness. In fact, we have this I-making going on for different people in different ways. Like maybe the athlete, strong, powerful body, a champion, baseball play well, baseball players, maybe they don't have necessarily beautiful bodies, but okay, <laughs> a weightlifter, 
identify strongly with the body, so the eye-making is with regard to the body. The person, very emotional person, we say the eye-making takes place in regard to the feelings. The person, sort of the intellectual who's always working out schemes of ideas, maybe philosophical systems. The eye-making then takes place with regard to perception, like the famous dictum of Descartes, I think, therefore I am. So he takes thinking to be the I, the self. Then the doer, the one who masters the art of the deal, the one who's <laughs> the greatest in U.S. history, who's passed through so much legislation. <laughs> That is the one who takes volition, identifies with the will as the I. And then maybe some of the spiritual philosophers who can attain like deep states of samadhi in which the mind becomes deeply concentrated and peaceful and the sense of the world vanishes. Those are the ones for whom the eye-making will take place on the basis of consciousness. So we have this, for example, in the Vedanta systems, like that everything in the body and the mental activities are not the self, but the pure awareness of consciousness, that is the Atman, the self. So that is eye-making. Then the mind-making is the way we create a sense of possessiveness, sort of grasping this and saying, this is mine, not yours. Of course, again, as a con matter of convention for doing things in society, certain allocation of material things and um, commodities, what is the term I'm looking for? The things that we use in everyday appliances and things is necessary. Like I have my car, or maybe I don't, but <laughs> you have your car, and say so you say, This is my car, and somebody just comes into the car and wants to drive it away. You say, No, you can't do that, that's my car. Excuse me? No, I was thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we use from a purely conventional standpoint, distinctions of what's mine, but the mind-making is where one really puts the sense of egotistic identification with one's possessions and thinks, this is mine, so it has to be, one has to make it better than the belongings of others. Maybe you see the guy with, you know, he won't drive the regular Honda, Toyota, but he has to have the Mercedes. Of course, if you, any of you have Mercedes, don't take it. <laughs> but it's people who want to pride themselves on their car or the brands that they use. In a way, that's kind of mind-making. And then the third is the underlying tendency to conceit, that subtle tendency to conceit. Okay, and so Radha, the monk Radha, is asking how one should contemplate in order to overcome this eye-making, mind-making, and latent tendency to conceit. And so then the Buddha says, any kind of material form whatsoever, this body or external materials that one might possess, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior, superior, far or near, one sees all form as it really is with correct wisdom. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Then the same, any kind of feeling, whatever, any kind of perception, whatever, any kind of volitional formations, any kind of consciousness, 
whether past, future, or present, etc., one sees all consciousness as it really is, with correct wisdom, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And when one knows and sees thus, then in regard to the body with consciousness, that is in regard to the five aggregates, and regard to all external objects, there is no more eye-making, mind-making, and tendency to conceit. Okay, so that takes care of the presentation on verse number five. No, I'm sorry, on verse number four, the one on conceit. So if there's any questions, please feel welcome to ask. I have to find my schedule. My schedule. Okay. Um, so you said that mana is from the root ma. Yeah. So is that a different root than manyati? It is a different root. Okay. But let me. Okay. I just want to see how much time we have in the session. Okay. It's a different root, but there's a tendency in Pali for them to become sort of conflated. Mm. So that we have another word, I'm actually going to come to it, I think, later. The word is manyana. Mm. So manyana is from the root man. The root man originally meant to think. Mm. Like manas, mano. Yeah, so from the root man we get mano. This is the organ of thought. And then there's the verb manyati, which probably originally was a neutral, in fact it is used neutrally, just meaning to think. But then it takes on a loaded meaning, which is to think in distorted ways. And in that way it tends to get conflated with mana. Though originally the two were different roots. Yes, please. And the, your name? How the airplane is going? Lynn. Lynn, okay. Um, the four classes that you talked about, um, the Indian culture, the four. The four, classes, yeah. Um, what were the first two, and why would they often switch? Were they similar? Okay, okay, yeah. Maybe I should have explained that. I, I think I overlooked that. The Kshatriyas were the administrative class. Originally they were warriors, but then they came into the position of being like the rulers. So the kings and the ministers of state and the, the rulers and different, the governors, they would come from the Kshatriya class. And the Brahmins were the ones who had charge of the Vedas, the sacred texts of the ancient Indian tradition. So they were the ones who performed the religious rituals based on the Vedas. So they would perform the rituals for the birth of the child, the, the marriage, blessing ceremonies, and then they align themselves with the Kshatriyas, you know, telling the Kshatriyas, if you want your rule to be successful, you have to perform so many sacrifices, and so the Brahmins would conduct the sacrifices, and in return, they would be generously supported by the Kshatriyas. Thank you, Vasne. My name is Neil. Neil. I have a question regarding um, conceit. <clears throat> is there a specific meditation to eliminate conceit? I think that there's no specific meditation subject except that this contemplation or of the five aggregates as being not mine, not I, not myself. And if one, one could do this as a reflective practice, ideally it's supposed to be the contemplation that comes at the advanced stage of insight that one could, when the mind becomes really deeply focused and one is able to observe the, at a very, very subtle level the impermanence of things, then one could see 
the five aggregates as being not self. But one could also do it as a reflective meditation. Just, of course the body is very clear, so one could just focus on the body. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Then one could sort of tune in to feelings, whatever feelings might be arising, feelings in the sense of pleasure, pain, neutral feelings, and then just reflect, this is not mine, not I, not myself. Then one's perceptions or thoughts, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Then all of the plans, projects, um, intentions that one has, consider this is not myself, and then even come to the awareness that's sort of flowing out through the six sense faculties and contemplate this consciousness is not mine, not I, not myself. So that will, even if it's done just in this intellectual, reflective way, it builds up the momentum that prepares the ground for direct insight into the selfless nature of the five aggregates. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sutta about Sunita, um, I was just wondering if you had any idea on how that teaching might have been received then, and also I was wondering if that is like sort of the basis. I know that in India there are some people who belong to that outcast class who like convert to Buddhism. Yeah. Does that take away the stigma of their birth once they become Buddhist, um, or mm. not? Okay. I don't know if I said that right. That's right, but there are two questions here. Kind of, yes. Okay. I'm trying to get... This is my problem when people ask two questions. Sorry. Well, the first one was how it would, would have... If you have oh. an idea of how that teaching was received. Yeah, that. actually, that's a very good point. Because it seems to me... In fact, there are a number of other suttas like this, that the Buddha in... Well, it wasn't the Buddha, but this is... But the compilers of the canon by including texts like that in the canon are, I don't like to use this expression, but I will, in a way they're giving a slap in the face to the Brahmins who are trying to impose the caste system and the idea that there are certain castes, especially themselves in the number one position, who are superior to all the others. And so by including that in the Theragata, it's sort of showing that for us, the Buddhists, these class distinctions are not meaningful. In fact, we even will reject, uh, I'm trying to find the exact word, resist or oppose the class distinctions through our compilations. And there's another along the lines, an interesting incident that's recorded in the Vinaya. When the Buddha went to his home city, Kapalavattu, in order for the first time to preach or to teach the Dhamma, he taught and then a number of the Sakyan youths, see the Sakyans, that's the Buddha's original family or clan, they were Kshatriyas and they believed that the Kshatriyas are the superior class and so a number of Kshatriya youths, the Buddha's cousins, half-brother, not, not the half but his cousins and maybe nephews and so on, decided that we should become Buddhist monks. And so they went after the Buddha and they brought along their barber, who was named Upali. The barbers were, I think, shudras, not the outcasts, but the fourth class. So they were considered much lower than the Kshatriyas. So they brought the barber along because when they were to be ordained they would be taking off their princely attire and their jewels and they didn't just want to discard them so their idea was to give them to the barber. And so they brought the barber Upali along and when they were ordained then they took their princely attire and their jewels and they put them into a bag and gave them to Upali and told Upali, you return to Kapalavattu and you explain to 
the elders there that we've become monks. But then Upali thought, I don't want to go back to Kapala Bhattu and continue to be a barber. I want to become a monk too. And so he told this to the to the Sakyan youths. And then the Sakyan youths had an idea, because they realized that as Sakyans they had this class pride. And so they wanted to do something to force themselves to lower their pride. And so they told Upali, not only can you be ordained, but you go to the head of the line for the ordination. You get ordained first and we get ordained after you. And so there is, like in Buddhist monasticism, this principle that like monks pay homage to the elders. And so if a monk is ordained before you, then you pay homage to that monk. So now the Sakyans put Upali ahead of them in the line. So Upali gets ordained first, and now the Sakyan youths, like Ananda and Anuruddha, they get ordained afterwards, and so now they have to pay homage to their former barber, Upali. And not only that, but this Upali became very, very skilled in learning the monastic discipline, with the Vinaya. And so amongst all of the disciples of the Buddha, Upali was declared the foremost in knowledge of the Vinaya, of discipline. Okay, any further questions now? I just want yep. to ask a question. Yep. For someone who has the conceit of superiority, how do, they, um, how do they behave in the world and interact with people without coming across as self-important or as self efficacy Somebody who has the conceit of superiority? Yes. How do they function in the world? Yes. Without how do they um, yeah. behave and, and express their truth without coming off as too self-aggrandized? Okay, that's a, a good question. But maybe I should put the point a little differently. If somebody has some like superior abilities and talents, yes. how can they, and skills, talents, qualities, how can they function in the world without sort of swelling up with conceit mm -hmm. and then becoming overbearing because of that conceit? Right. Yeah, what I would say is that if one has these superior skills, talents, abilities, one recognizes that, you know, one doesn't try to dismiss them, mm -hmm. but one thinks that these talents, abilities, these might be like the results of previous cultivation or of my past merits. And even now, it's not mine, not I, not myself. They're just dharmas, just um, conditions in the world. And so one appreciates them, it sort of builds upon them, but without identifying with them. And then using them as a basis for ranking oneself in relation to others. Just real quick, so the, do the converted uh, yeah. outcasts yeah. become, you know, a different class yeah. once they convert to Buddhism? You know, I don't have first-hand experience in the Indian culture, but what I think is amongst themselves now, they don't regard themselves as being outcasts or having that stigma which has been imposed upon them but perhaps in their interactions with the caste Hindus. The caste Hindus would think, even though they converted to Buddhism, but they're still outcasts. But that's the kind of question you should have asked Aya Yeshi, because I know, I know. she was living, you know, immersed in that, in that culture. Okay, when... Um, this like, concept of conceit, like, is also in Buddha teaching says, uh, you know, some sorrow comes from craving, yeah. and that's due to ignorance. So, conceit, I don't, I kind of understand it, like, you know, the attitude of, like, a conceit, like, I'm superior, or I'm inferior. Like, in terms of craving, like, because if, like, all some sour is, like, created by mind's grasping and um, craving, the conceit, like, what is the mind um, grasping when it's con 
when it has this quality, like, I know I, like, why I'm superior, I'm just saying why I'm inferior. Like, what is the craving? What is the craving? Yeah, when the mind is like, in this conceit, you know, or what's the, what's the grasping? My conjecture would be, I, I haven't thought about that kind of question before, but what I would think is that conceit is a kind of, actually before I use the expression, an outcrop of ignorance, but it's also an outcrop of craving, the craving to establish some kind of solid being for oneself. And so, through the craving, to establish some kind of solid being for oneself, one gives rise to this notion, in the first instance, the notion, I am, and then one grasps that notion, and then starts using it as a basis for ranking oneself, rating oneself, and comparing oneself and up with others. I think that's the way it works. Okay, I think I want to now move on to the next verse. So again, let us go back to the text. Okay, so now we come to verse number five. So I'll read it in Pali. Yo na jagama Yo na jagama Bhavesu saram Bhavesu saram Vichinam pupamiva Vichinam pupamiva Udumbaresu Udumbaresu So biku jahati so Oraparam Oraparam Urago Jinamiva Urago Jinamiva Tacham Puranam Tacham Puranam Okay, and then the translation reads One who finds no core or substance in states of existence, as one seeking flowers in Udumbara trees finds none. That monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. Okay, so first, the simile. There's a kind of tree that grows in South Asia called the Udumbara tree. It's a kind of fig tree. And actually, what I've read in an article by a scholar who knows, a scholar about the South Asia, uh, somebody with a, in the field of botany who knows about, who studied the South Asian fig trees, he says that there are actually flowers, but they are concealed in some other part of the tree. So you don't find them like growing out, like, you know, flowers that you can clearly see. But still the tree does have these very subtle hidden flowers. But I think in the traditional Indian belief system, they thought that the Udumbara trees do not have flowers. And so here, somebody might be looking for flowers in the Udumbara, these fig trees, and they don't find the flowers. And the commentary gives the story of a Brahmin whose daughter was about to be married, and he wanted to give her the flowers, the garland of flowers that kind that nobody has ever given their daughter before. 
and he thought that he could find the flowers in the Udumbara trees. And so he went searching through the Udumbara trees, looking for flowers, and didn't find them, until he encountered some monk who asked him, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm looking for Udumbara flowers. And then the monk said, there are no Udumbara flowers. <laughs> Apparently the monk didn't know the subtleties of modern botany. <laughs> Okay, so this is compared to searching for sara, the word sara. Actually, we have it in front of us, I don't have to <laughs> type it again. The word sara originally meant in a tree, the heartwood of the tree. But then as an extended meaning, it comes to mean the essence or substance of anything. And so actually, even in this verse, sara could do metaphorically for heartwood. You know, it's like the core of something. And one is searching in states of existence to find some kind of underlying substance, some immutable, changeless, permanent substance. And in fact, like the, in the pre-Buddhist philosophical development in India, the quest, the great quest, was to find the sara the essence of the world and of the person. And so the Indian philosophers, the thinkers whose reflections and con conclusions are recorded in the Upanishads, collection of texts, were searching for the first the inner essence of the person. And they came across the notion that at the core of the person there is this immutable, substantial essence which they call the Atman, the Self. And then they also reflected on the nature of the world, or the cosmos, the ever-changing cosmos, and they came to the conclusion that underlying all of the, the panoramic transformations, and changes of the phenomenal world, there is this underlying ground, this immutable ground, which they call Brahman. And then the great declaration or proclamation of the Upanishads is that the Atman, the innermost core of the person, the self, the true self, and the underlying ground of the changing universe are one and the same. That the self and the essence of the universe are, with the highest knowledge, seem to be identical. And yet it was just this that the Buddha sort of undermined with his teaching that within the person there is no immutable, changeless core, no substantial self. What we call the person is the sort of collaborative functioning of the five aggregates. And all the aggregates are not mine, not myself. And the world is just a constant, sort of unfolding of ever-changing phenomena. So now we could turn to some of the additional texts. Okay, so here we have a sutta on the nature of existence. Okay, so this is one time the Venerable Ananda comes to the Buddha and he says that one speaks of existence, existence bhava, and so the Buddha, uh, he asked the Buddha, just how is their existence? And then the Buddha says, if there were no karma 
ripening in the sense sphere realm, would there appear any sense sphere existence? Now we're coming to the three realms of existence that I spoke of last night. Actually, the sense sphere existence, you can also call, sometimes this is also called the desire realm. And so Ananda says, surely not, Bhante. Then the Buddha says, therefore, Ananda, karma is the field, consciousness is the seed, and craving is the moisture for the consciousness of beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving to become established in a lower realm. The lower realm is the sense sphere or desire realm. And so in this way, there is renewed existence in the future. This is a very compacted statement, so let's unpack it a little bit. In fact, I have to say, I don't completely understand the simile. <laughs> Maybe somebody could help me with it. Because I think, tend to think of karma as also being the seed, sort of the karmic consciousness as being the seed. How karma is the field, it's not quite clear to me. But anyway, the point is that it's through that karma is what directs the stream of consciousness to a particular realm of existence. Okay. Ignorance which is not un means not understanding things as they really are and craving the craving to go on existing and experiencing through the senses. So ignorance and craving together are the fundamental roots of repeated existence. So craving, I say, is the impelling or propelling force, and ignorance is the underlying darkness that keeps the propulsion turning. Well, here it actually uses the metaphor of craving as being the fetter and ignorance the hindrance. So those two are what keep sentient beings revolving and turning over again and again within samsara, within the cycle of birth and death. And what directs one, the street, what directs the stream of consciousness to a particular realm of existence is the karma, the volitional actions. And so here, we have the desire realm. Okay, last night. Okay, so it's our karma that brings us into the human realm as human beings. And if one creates unwholesome karma, that karma leads, according to its gravity and its particular characteristics, leads to rebirth into the three bad destinations, the hells, the sphere of the afflicted spirits, sometimes called the hungry ghosts, and then the animals. And then if one creates wholesome karma, that wholesome karma leads to rebirth as human beings, or if it's very pure karma, to 
to rebirth amongst the devas in the heavenly realms. Okay, so that is how renewed existence takes place. The Buddha calls it He says that one becomes established in a lower realm because of the three realms of existence, the desire realm is the lowest. Okay, then the next text says, if there were no karma ripening in the form realm, would there appear any form sphere or form realm existence? And then the answer, surely not, Bhante. And so what is the karma that ripens in the form realm? This is the attainment of those states of meditative samadhi called the jhanas. The jhana, it's the mind becomes collected, concentrated, one-pointed, and the mind within the jhana is not a kind of mind that corresponds to the normal human mind or even to the minds of the devas in the lower heavenly worlds. But the jhana consciousness is the basic type of consciousness of the beings in the form realm. So when one attains and maintains the jhana, that meditative absorption is generating the karma that leads the stream of consciousness to rebirth in the form realm, in those divine, super-divine realms of existence. And so again the Buddha says, karma is the field, consciousness the seed, craving the moisture, for the consciousness of beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving to be established in an intermediate or middling realm. And so there is renewed existence in the future. And note that when there is rebirth, even in in the form realm, that rebirth again is driven or maintained by ignorance and craving. There's some kind of craving or attachment to the jhanic experience, and then that attachment to the jhanic experience propels the consciousness at death upward towards the form realm and results in rebirth in the form realm. Okay, then the next, the third is If there were no karma ripening in the formless realm, would there appear any formless fear existence? Okay, the jhanas are ranked in four levels. First jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. Okay, but beyond the fourth jhana, there is another state of meditative absorption which is considered superior, from a mundane point of view, considered superior to the jhanas. Actually, there are four levels of concentration beyond the jhanas, considered superior to the jhanas. These are called the four arupas, the four formless meditative attainments. Their names are the base of the boundlessness of space, the base of the boundlessness of consciousness, the base of nothingness, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And those meditative states, or the mind in those meditative states, is the typical state of mind for beings who are dwelling in the formless realm of existence. Yeah, the 
form realm has something like 15 levels. <clears throat> and the formless realm has the four levels. So for example, if one, as a human meditator, one masters the first formless meditation called the base of boundless space, and one dwells in it often and sort of solidifies, consolidates that attainment, then the consciousness, one's mind, one is generating the karma that tends to rebirth in the formless realm called the realm of boundless space. And if one maintains that the ability to maintain, if one maintains the ability to attain that state up to the time of one's death, then it's likely that the consciousness will take rebirth in the realm of boundless space, and so for the other levels of attainment. From the Buddha's point of view, all rebirth in all of these realms is considered unsatisfactory. Of course, as I said last night, in the formless realm, the lifespan can be 20,000, 30,000 kalpas, great aeons, but it comes to an end. And then it's back to human existence, and going to kindergarten again, <laughs> and, um, applying to college, and getting married, getting a job, getting old. Having to face some future incarnation of, what's his name, Mitch McConnell? <laughs> <laughs> trying to push through some brutal form of health, quote, health care. Okay, so through this karma of the formless attainments, the consciousness is established in a, here it's called a lofty realm, a superior realm. So that is how there is a rebirth or renewed existence in the future. Okay, here's an interesting, it's a rather, again, a very compressed sutta. Not so clear, but I think I've been able to interpret it. Okay, so the text says, this is from Samyutta Nikaya, what one intends and what one plans and whatever tendencies lie latent, this becomes a basis for the maintenance of consciousness. When there is a basis, there is a support for the establishing of consciousness. When consciousness is established and has come to growth, there is the production of future renewed existence, and when there is the production of future renewed existence, then there is future birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. Okay, so what one intends and what one plans, this, these are the volitions and the intentions, the plans that are creating karma. This is my interpretation. And then the tendencies that lie latent, this would be especially the deep tendencies towards ignorance and craving. So those together become, function as a basis for the maintenance of consciousness, that is, as a support for consciousness to continue on at death. So it's the tendencies of ignorance and craving that are there, sort of maintaining the continuity of consciousness, and the intention and plans generating the karma that directs consciousness 
or steers it in a particular direction. And so that is the basis for maintaining the continuity of consciousness. And so when there is the ba that basis, there is a support for the establishing of consciousness, a support for consciousness which is now like cut off and detached from this body or this organism. It's a support for consciousness to become established in another realm of existence, in another living organism, which has sort of just taken shape in the case of human life, in organism, a fetus that's just taken shape in the mother's womb. So that is how consciousness becomes established there. Okay, then when consciousness is established and then is starting to come to growth, then there is the production of a renewed existence. So now the new existence is congealing because consciousness has become established. So con consciousness has gotten, like, say, in a human life, it gets a foothold in the womb, in the fetus, in the womb. And so with that, there comes, there starts the production of a new existence. And then when there is that production of the new existence, the new existence starts, then there is birth, old age, and death, and so on. Okay, so these uh, suttas that I've covered, that I've taken so far, are showing how existence occurs according to the Buddha's teaching. And buffa here, it doesn't mean like the existence of inanimate objects like these glasses or this clock, but it means a concrete, individual, sentient existence. And so the Brahmins and the Brahminic thinkers were searching for some core, solid, substantial core within existence. And the Buddha rejected the very notion of a solid, substantial core. And the reason is that all existence is impermanent. This is from the Udana. He says, whatever states of existence there are everywhere, of whatever kind, all these states of existence are, empt are impermanent and dukkha, they're bound up with suffering and subject to change. Okay, and then I took a sutta, one of the few early suttas, of suttas in the Pali Canon, in which the theme of emptiness is brought up. And here the Venerable Ananda comes to the Buddha and says, apparently Ananda heard the saying that the empty is the world, empty is the world. In what sense, he's asking, is going to be said, the world is empty. And then the Buddha says, it's because the world is empty of self and of what belongs to self, that it is said that empty is the world, that the world is empty. And then he says, what is empty of self and of what belongs to self? The I is empty of self and what belongs to self. The visible forms are empty of self and what belongs to self. I consciousness is empty. I contact is empty. And any feeling that arises with eye contact as condition, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neutral feeling, that too is empty of self and of what belongs to self. Okay, so that is said of all of the of the eye, the entire process occurring through the eye, and the same thing is said of all of the other senses, the ear and sounds, nose and odors, tongue and taste, body and tactile objects, the mind and mental phenomena. And 
And so it's because it's in this way that because all of these things are empty of self and of what belongs to self, that it is said, empty is the world. So this is sort of the Buddha's response to the Brahminic thesis that at the core of the person, at the core, at the core of the person, there is the Atman, the true permanent self, and underlying all of the phenomena of the world is the Brahman, the substantial ground of the world. But for the Buddha, the internal sense processes are all empty of self, and externally all of the objects of sensory cognition are empty of self. And then, sort of to elaborate on this from a different point of view, there is a sutta on the five aggregates, how the five aggregates are empty. So in interestingly, for some reason, the sutta doesn't use the word sunya, which is rendered as empty, but it uses other words that are synonymous with sunya. And the Buddha illustrates here the emptiness of the five aggregates using a very poignant simile for each aggregate. So the first case he begins, at that time, I think, the Buddha and the monks, they were sitting on the bank of the Ganges River. So the Buddha says, suppose this river Ganges was carrying along a great lump of foam. And then from a distance, you see the great lump of foam, and it looks like a solid rock being carried along by the river. But then a man with good uh, <laughs> eyesight would inspect it ponder it and carefully investigate it and it would appear to him to be void, hollow, insubstantial for what substance could there be in a lump of foam? It's just a bunch of little bubbles sort of held together by what is it? I guess it's the dirt from the surface of the water that's sort of been congealed into a adhesive substance that holds that massive foam together. And so the Buddha uses this as a simile for material form. So whatever material form there is, past, future or present and so on, a monk inspects it, examines it and carefully investigates it and it appears to him to be void, hollow, insubstantial, for what substance could there be in form? It's, I say it's quite interesting that you know, the Buddha said this 2,500 years ago, and you know, if you ask an ordinary person, or maybe even an education, educated person, at that time and through the centuries, is this table solid? You know, they would say, of course it's solid, hard, substantial. But now with our modern physics, you know, we've, I don't really know that much of physics, so if any physicist here to embarrass me. <laughs> okay, so, but the physicists look into matter, and they say, like, what is matter? You know, it looks so solid, but we have made up of atoms, and then the atom, you have, like, a nucleus, surrounded by a cloud of electrons and I've read someplace that the nucleus would be like taking a ping pong ball and putting it in the middle of a football field and then the electrons would be like people sitting in the last row of the the stand where the spectators sit, and all of the rest of that, all of the other seats and the football field is empty space. <laughs> and so the nucleus of the atom is like that ping pong ball, the electrons are like the spectators in the back, a few spectators, and all of the rest empty space. 
And so this is, in a way, very similar, like the Buddha is speaking about examining material form. And even those so-called subatomic particles are really just, in a way, transformations of energy or manifestations of energy, so they can be transformed into energy. Okay, so that is material form, so one examines it, even this body, one examines, breaks it down into cells and molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, and they're empty. Even those you know, the subatomic particles are always changing, not remaining the same. Okay, now we come to the aggregate of feeling, and here the Buddha uses a different simile that in autumn, when it is raining, and then there will be like a pool of water, and then big raindrops are falling onto the pool of water or onto a lake, and then water bubbles rise up, and then as soon as they rise up, immediately they burst on the surface of the water. And so maybe some, uh, if you look at the big water drops hitting the surface of the water and the bubble comes up, that bubble looks quite big and solid. <laughs> but a person with good sight looks at it carefully and those, he sees the bubbles breaking and realizes that they are all along, they've been void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a water bubble? And so whatever kind of feeling there is, when it inspects it, examines it, and it appears void, hollow, substanceless. One moment there's pleasant feeling, next moment painful feeling, and even if, like, you're sitting in meditation, there's what seems to be a persisting painful feeling, say in the legs or in the back, but if you attend to it consistently, you see that that enduring feeling is actually just a string of moments of feeling. Each one just arises and passes, arises and passes. Of course, the string of feelings doesn't pass so easily unless you change your leg, the position of your legs. But the individual feelings themselves are just arising and breaking up. Okay, then comes the aggregate of perception. <clears throat> And this is something that probably everybody has experienced when driving along a flat road, when the sun is shining brightly, particularly in very dry weather. So here's we have the last month of the hot season at high noon, a shimmering mirage appears. Or if we're driving along that flat road, often when you, when you look out the window, it looks like there's a puddle of water, a pool of water ahead on the road. But then when you get to that section of the road, the pool of water vanishes, but it reappears a few hundred yards further ahead. And again, when you drive up there, it's gone. And so, in our case, when we drive over that apparent pool of water and it disappears, then we realize that pool of water was void, hollow, and insubstantial. And so perception is always taking things to be, you know, form it, we're always forming ideas of things and it seems that our ideas and conceptions are so real and solid but when one looks into the perception itself, the process of perception, one sees that the perceptions are just arising and passing. And so whatever kind of perceptions there are, those two appear to be void, hollow, and insubstantial. Perceptions, one perception arising, another perception arising, and so there's no solidity in perception. 
you could see this maybe in experience in meditation. You might be sitting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Attending to the breath, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. That guy that used to sit behind me when I was in the sixth grade, <laughs> what was his name? <laughs> was it Mark? Was it Stephen? What was his name? What was his name? What was his name? Mark, Stephen, what is it? Oh, my breath. <laughs> okay. In breath, out breath, in breath, out breath. What was I thinking about just a moment ago? <laughs> I can't remember. I have to remember what I was thinking about. I, I knew it was something. <laughs> I know it was something really important. <laughs> really important. <laughs> Perceptions, you know, they come and they go just like that. Okay, the fourth simile is for the aggregate of the volitional formations, volitional activities. And this is compared to the trunk of a plantain. The plantain it's a kind of, it's similar to the banana, sort of cousin of, of the banana. And basically the tree is, the same, is, is very similar. So here we have a man who needs heartwood. The word here is actually sara, heartwood. So he's wandering in search of heartwood with an axe, and he enters a forest, and then he sees a plantain tree growing, and he sees it has a steady trunk, and he thinks, ah, I can get heartwood from that trunk. So he cuts down the plantain tree at the root, cuts off the crown, and then he sees that the trunk of the plantain tree consists of a roll or a coil. So he unrolls the coil, unrolls it one time, the second time, third time, keeps on unrolling it until there's one coil inside another coil inside another coil, similar to an onion. If you're trying to find the pit of an onion, you don't find anything there. It's just one layer after another layer after another layer. And so the plantain tree is the same. And so you don't, he doesn't even find softwood, let alone hardwood. And so the man with good sight inspects that trunk of the plantain tree and sees that it is hollow, void, insubstantial. And so this is the case with the volitional activities. I'm planning this, planning that, intending this, intending that. So the plans, intentions, volitions, desires, imaginings, designs, aspirations, wishes, recollections, fears, worries, concerns, all of these arise and they appear to be, when, they, when they're present, they can be so convincing, seductive, oppressive, overwhelming, but when you see that they are just fleeting, transient mental states, then they disclose themselves as void, hollow, insubstantial. So they're empty. Okay, and then the fifth simile is for the aggregate of consciousness. I understand consciousness to be the basic, what I call the basic awareness that arises on the basis of the six sense faculties and sort of flows out through the sense faculty, illuminating a particular objective domain. 
And so this is being compared to a magical illusion. And so the Buddha says, suppose that a magician or his apprentice would display a magical illusion at a crossroads. So the magician puts up a table, he takes sticks, from stones, leaves. Perhaps in India, in the Buddhist time, there were very clever magicians. And he says, you see, there's nothing on the table but these thick stones and dried leaves. Then he waves a wand and puts, rub, throws a, uh, puts a cloth over it and waves a wand and recites some mantra and pulls the cloth away. And there is a miniature palace of sparkling jewels. And everybody is looking, wow, magnificent, um, wonderful, unbelievable. Okay, but maybe what the magician has done is to put like a paper sheet with an image of a little palace with jewels in front of the batch of stick stones and dried leaves and somehow convincing people that there's really a magical palace there. But now a man with good sight comes and inspects it and examines it and he slips behind the magician and sees what the magician is doing and he sees that it's void, hollow, insubstantial. And so here the Buddha says, this applies to consciousness, like consciousness streaming out, say, through the eye, illuminating the visual field. So I see what seems to be a very solid, real, visible world in front of me. But maybe if we use like the scientific analysis, what I am seeing are light waves within particular bands of the light spectrum. So I see a blue shirt, that's light waves within the blue band of the spectrum. Um, nobody, okay, purple. I'm trying to get some this clear, distinct colors, not grays and browns. <laughs> so the purple in the purple band of the spectrum. Gray must be a mixture of brown and a mixture of other bands within the spectrum. So it's really just light at certain bands within the spectrum. But this is the deceptive work of consciousness to make all of this seem real and substantial. And so consciousness too, the Buddha says, is, turns out to be hollow, void, hollow, insubstantial. Okay, and here the Buddha applies, uh, again, another sutta in which the Buddha shows how the monk investigates the five aggregates, looking for any kind of core that can be taken as I and mine. So he investigates material form to the extent that there is a range for form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness, to the extent that there is a range for consciousness. And as he investigates these five aggregates, each in its own range, he doesn't find any I, mine, or I am there. And so these notions of I, mine, and I am that previously occurred to him no longer occur. Okay, so that takes care now of our exposition of verse number five. So maybe I'll ask whether we have any questions. Dante, um, when you spoke about the, the different realms of existence, the uh, desire realm, the mm -hmm. form realm, the formless realm, mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, is there anywhere in the suttas where it specifies whether the sutta vasa devas have physical form or not? With the, the Sudhavasa, the pure, the pure Bodhi. Yeah. 
Yeah, they would have physical form. Yeah, because they're in the form realm. Um, is that in the suttas or is that in the commentaries? I think the very fact that they're in the form realm means that they have to have form. What I, I'm asking, are they classified in the form realm in the suttas? Or is that classification uh, in the commentaries? That up. Is that not in, in my mind right now? Yeah. yeah. Fine. But they do come when the Buddha is enumerating in an ascending order the different realms mm-hmm. or the different planes of existence after coming through the regular planes of existence of the form realm. Then he comes to the Sudhavasa realms. And then after that, he comes to the base of boundless space, the base of boundless consciousness. And yeah, that's why I ask, because they're, they're right on the border between those two, but I couldn't think of anywhere where he clearly states they either yeah. have bodies or don't have bodies. Yeah, that I would have to sort of look in, because it's not a point that I investigated previously. Okay, somebody... Okay, think your name? Lillian. 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 Um, so... Essentially, this is non-self, right? This is this is emptiness and yeah, non-self. Yeah, yeah. If you want to just pull all these realms right, together, yeah, right, yeah. and that that's the goal, that's the the bhavana, that's the becoming, right? That's the becoming, the, to go towards emptiness. Well, I say for non-self. That, I say that the goal is. Well, I actually passed over this. The goal is liberation. And the insight into non-self or emptiness is not the goal, but it is the decisive means for reaching the goal. Right. So what, the way this passage on the five aggregates continues, so the instructed noble, seeing in this way the instructed noble disciple then becomes disenchanted or disillusioned with form through consciousness, then becoming disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. This is viraga, the fading away of the attachment. And then through dispassion, the mind is liberated. And when it's liberated, then there comes the knowledge, the reflective knowledge. It's liberated. And he understands, I'm finished with birth, with repeated birth. The spiritual life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to the state of being. So that's a means to an end. The insight into non-self. Rather than a goal. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sponsor. Yeah. You mentioned the form and formless jhanas, and I wanted to know if when a meditator experiences the rupa jhana, do they rest, and when they rest in the rupa jhana, do they experience the six sense spaces, or are they secluded from sensuality? Okay, when one is in the, the jhanas, okay, then there's no activity through the five external sense faculties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that there's no perception of visible forms through the eyes or sounds through the ears and so on. But the mind is still functioning in the state of, of absorption. So the mind is still there, completely absorbed on its internal object. Okay, we'll take Albert and then Wendy. Um, why in the sutta do you italicize, is, uh, is it italicized kind of consciousness so instead of just consciousness? Or it, with reference to all the aggregates there? Oh, in this passage? Yeah. Uh, uh, just to make it easier to see which particular aggregate is being described by that simile. Okay, so so you, you still could just refer to just perception. There's no there's no distinction in meaning there when you when no. is it kind of perception. No, 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 no. It's just to make it easy to follow the, the passage. Yeah. Which is fine, but and then I just don't 
understand like when these consciousness, like you know, before the universe is formed, obviously there was like this void, there was like nothing, just emptiness. And when the conscious like they sprout out, like why like if it sprout out from you know, it carries this like quality of infinite intelligence, compassion and all those sort of things, because that's the I mean the uh, so when there's the, the, the boy right before the universe is born and when the consciousness like comes out, it, it carries the essence of like you know, infinite intelligence, compassion, all those sort of things. So what I don't understand is like why when it comes out, it it becomes like confused. It's like this is not what it is, and it becomes very individualized. And you go through this huge long yeah. path and yeah. searching for the truth. And yeah. like after like an infinite amount of time, like, oh, I finally get it. And you go back, it's like I see. I see. Yeah. Actually according to the Buddha's teaching, uh, there's no time in which there's no universe. So it's not the case that the universe for through infinity has not existed and suddenly it comes into being out of nowhere and then <laughs> we come into the universe out of nowhere. But what the Buddha teaches is that without any discoverable first point, this process of cosmic of world systems have been arising, developing, dissolving and passing away. That this has been going on through beginningless time. And that us, we sentient beings, have been transmigrating or wandering through the course of birth and death, through time without beginning. So, you know, we've gone through all of these earlier past world systems without any first point, without any beginning. Is there always a universe of form? Always a universe? Of form? I remember a story about formless devas eating somehow material... Yeah, what is said, and I don't know how literally to take this, but it said that there comes a time when this world system disintegrates and then the beings are for the most part, the beings who are here now are for the most part reborn in a particular realm or plane of existence in the form realm called the Abhastara realm, the realm of streaming radiance. And then they remain there for a very long time until this particular physical universe has the chance to start to it, Dis dissolves and disintegrates, then it starts to become reconstituted, to evolve again. And then it's said that at that time when this happens, this world is sort of covered over by this, um, like this pool with this delicious substance on it, and then the beings come down, they're reborn from this higher plane back into this world, and they have bodies, luminous bodies, and they can travel around just by an act of will, and they're very happy and content. And then some being sees this, the ponds that are covered with this delicious substance, and then out of greed or curiosity, reaches down and takes a lump of it and eats it and finds it delicious. And then when he does that, then his body starts to become grosser. And then in this way, and then he tells the other beings who are like these, with these bodies of light, and they also, because he, they received this favorable report, <laughs> and so they eat it, and their bodies become gross. And in this way, there's a kind of gradual deterioration of human life, of, of sentient life takes place until we're in our present situation. Yeah, this could be taken sort of metaphorically. I don't know how literally I would take that. This seems to be a metaphor for the way greed arises and then causes deterioration. Yeah. Um, 
Bonte, I have a question on karma and how um, you mentioned volitional actions. Yeah. So I can understand. Um, well, actually, I'll just give a simple uh, yeah. ask a simple question: Is everything that we are experiencing karma, or is it limited to a certain sphere? So, for example, if I go out to the beach and I get sunburned, yeah. is the sunburn? Yeah. Karma, like the effect of, yeah. of karma, or yeah. is it just my reaction to the sunburn um, yeah. that is karma? I tend to doubt that everything that happens to us is happening as the fruit of karma. There are actually like different perspectives on this. In the Abhidhamma system, it said that all like feelings that arise through the five sense faculties. are the results of karma. But it seems to me that that is not so acceptable, just in my understanding. I would assume that the results of karma, that, car that many things happen to us that are not the result of karma, but particular things do happen through the ripening of karma. So I take karma to be like one thread in the tapestry of forces that bring results, that bring that have impacts upon our experience. But wouldn't that then mean that something then just happened randomly? Um, so My guess is perhaps that that is so, yeah. But then isn't um, Buddhism all about like sort of cause and effect? So if there is, um, I mean, at least conventional reality, so we live in a conditional, so there is a condition, yeah. therefore I experience yeah. an effect. Yeah. Um, so if then my experience, some things is, are the result of karma and then some other things are the result of just random, randomness. Well, uh, uh, it's not that they're happening randomly, but there will be other, there will be causes for them. It's just that not all of the causes operating are karma. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the beach and you get stay out too long under the sun and you get sunburned, it's not just random, but the cause of that is that the heat, the way the heat waves from the sun burn the skin, and so you become sunburned. So this cause and effect is still operating, but it's just in this case not karmic causation. Bhante, yep. um, it seemed to me that it could still be explained as the result of karma, and that it was her karma that led to her having this body, yep. which is prone to being burned when it's exposed to the sun, um, and also that she led to being born in on this particular planet, which yep. has a thin ozone layer, which means yep. enough UV gets through to your skin and so on. Okay, you can say you know the karma is operating in that sense, but whether the particular sunburn that she experiences on say July 21st, just say you got sunburned on that day, that that, sun, that that sunburn was directly caused by the karma. It's something I would put a question mark about. Mm -hmm. I, I can't speak from knowledge and say that I know that it's not the result of karma. But there's a sutta where somebody, a wanderer, comes to the Buddha and asks whether everything that a person experiences is a result of karma. And the Buddha says it's not so. And then he enumerates a number of causes of illnesses. I think sort of the point of the question is whether all illnesses are caused by karma. And the Buddha says that there are illnesses caused by... He uses a traditional Indian medical terminology, illnesses caused by phlegm, wind, bile, a combination of the three, um, or then by accidents, by careless behavior. And then in the last instance he mentions that there are illnesses or feelings that are caused by karma, they are the result of karma. Which to my mind, I have to say I also raise a question mark about that, because if somebody gets persistently ill, say, from a bile disease, and the doctor diagnoses your illness is due to bile, 
uh, one could say, okay, this is what is apparent at the empirical level, mm -hmm. but we could say, why is that person prone to the bile disease? A karmic disposition is manifesting. Anyway, this is, these are the kind of questions that are very difficult to answer. And right, I think we should, yeah, at this point, take a break.